Well, well, we're going to start a new video. As usual, we're going to look at what's in the sky. I've taken the atmosphere away so we can see the, uh, what's behind the atmosphere, daytime sky, June the 29th. I've set the clock at 12. Uh, 42. Let's stop the second so it will stop moving. Okay, just look at this picture for a moment. Got the sun over here. You got Venus on one side on the other. I don't know if you can see it, but do you, do you see a blue round object back here and a red round object out here and a yellow round object right there? The problem is when you try to click on it, nothing happens. It'll show you the stars around it, but it won't show you what these objects are. And when you try to zoom in, zoom, I can't even talk. When you try to zoom in on them, they start to fade away. Notice how they're fading out? And they just fade out. But if you go back a little bit, see a red object right here, a blue object right here, and a yellow object right here. You can also see the stars behind it. Let's click on this one star behind it. Probus, a variable star, or double star. It shows the star beside it. The distance of the uh, Probus Propus, I can't even pronounce it, is 349.20 light years away. But if I try to click on the yellow object, nothing appears. I try to click on the blue object, the star beside it appears. That's 5 gem. It is 568.22 light years away. But if I try to click on the blue round ball, nothing happens. I try to click on the red round ball, nothing happens. But yet I can click on the stars. So let's click on a star. Got this one right here. This star is 231.65 light years away. We know it's out there. It's a long way out there. That's a pulsating variable star. Uh, let's see. Let's click on this one. This is VGEM. This is 544.50 light years away. Okay, let's click on this one over here. Nepsuta, 844.96 light years away. Interesting. I did not mean to hit that. But notice you have Venus on one side of the sun. And then you have Mercury on the other side of the sun. Let's hit this dot down here. Alhina, 109.30 light years away. Let's put the atmosphere back for a moment. I want to show you something. Okay, we've got daytime sky. Let's put it to the nighttime sky. What do we have here? What's in our nighttime sky tonight? Well, look at that. Jupiter and Mars. Got Saturn back there. Isn't that interesting that we can see Jupiter and Mars tonight. Go out, look at the stars. It's going to be beautiful. Now let's get to the normal tutorial. Now that we know what's in our sky, what we are looking at. A uh, gentleman asked me to put this up. Uh, I'm assuming it's a gentleman. Um, but the question was, where exactly is Nibiru's orbit? Actually, they asked me to put up a hula hoop uh, to show them. A hula hoop on a picture. This is the best I can do. <laughs> okay, sun is here. Then we have uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. This is the asteroid belt right here. Then we have Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus. Oh, lost a picture. Hold on. Always happens. Technical di difficulties. Uranus, 
Uh, so it was telling me the color scheme. Okay. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So where no, the Nibiru system travels has always traveled for millions and millions and millions of years. Will continue to travel for millions and millions and millions of years. Is in this orbit between the space of Mars and Jupiter. It has an extremely long elliptical orbit, 3,600 years. It never comes near Earth. Earth is right here in the green. Mars is right here in the pink. See that? This is the asteroid belt. It travels in the area of the asteroid belt between Mars in the pink and Jupiter in the blue. So I hope that helps you kind of get an idea of this is the neighborhood of the Nibiru system. This is its neighborhood. This is its orbit right here. And it never comes near Earth. And again, let's let's talk about this. I'm going to leave this picture up while we talk about this. Because I, I've got so many, I got over 342 emails uh, since my last video. And a lot of them were asking me the, the exact same questions. Um, and I call, I made a call for all of y'all to start questioning other people where do they get their information from um, but y'all keep asking me um, where other people are getting their information from and again all I can say is I don't know why other people say the things that they do although it's not based on science it's not based on the pre Nubian or Sumerian text um, so we're going to go through a quick rundown of something that I want you to look up. You can Google this yourself. It's called Nibiru Cataclysm. Uh, it's off of Wikipedia, um, but uh, if you don't want to, let, let's just talk. Okay, everybody's asking me about um, who said that Nibiru is going to be the end of the world. We're all going to die. Where is this coming from? <coughs> Okay, long story short, you can read it for yourself if you Google it, but long story short, and uh, the idea was first put forward in 1995 by a lady named Nan, probably going to mispronounce her last name, but I'm going to call her Leader, or Lighter. Let's call her Lighter. Uh, she's the founder of the Zeta Talk group. L Lighter describes herself as uh, a contactee with the ability to receive messages from extraterrestrials from the Zeta Reticuli uh, star system through an implant in her brain. She states that she was chosen to warn mankind that an object would sweep through the inner solar system in May of 2003. Long story short, May of 2003 came, it went, nothing happened. Then she came back and said in uh, 2012, oh yes, the, the extraterrestrials told me it's 2012. That's when we're all going to die. Well, as you know, 2012 came and went and nothing happened. And <laughs> but a little bit more information about this, Nancy. I'm going to call her lighter. Um, we're going to, uh, let me just read this. The idea of the Nibiru encounter originated with Nancy Leiter, a Wisconsin woman who claims that as a girl she was contacted uh, by gray extraterrestrials called Zetas who implanted a communication device in her brain. In 1995, she founded a website, Zeta Talk, to uh, disseminate her ideas. A lighter's first came to public attention on internet uh, news groups during the built up of Halley's Comet, uh, excuse me, Comet Hale Bob in 1996. She stated, claiming to speak to the Zetas, that the Hale Bob Comet does not exist. It is a fraud perpetuated by those who would have the teeming masses. Uh, uh, Point of <laughs> until it's too late. 
Hale Bob is nothing more than a distant star and will draw no closer. She, <laughs> she claimed that Hale Bob's story was a manufacturer to, dis, uh, to distract people from the imminent arrival of a large planetary object, Planet X, which would soon pass by Earth and destroy civilization. Okay, it goes on and on and on about, yeah, she was wrong. Um, the common hail bop actually did exist and, yeah, it did pass by and nothing happened. The world did not die. Uh, it goes on and on and on about how the, uh, the extraterrestrials heard. Yeah, the, the date is May 27, 2003. It's... Um, and it's exactly 5.9 terrestrial days before the earth is destroyed. <laughs> there will be a massive destabilizing pole shift and everyone will die. Well, of course, 2003 came and went and nothing happened. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Lighter went on to say that... Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, ta oh, it talks about uh, another guy from her group named Mark Hazelwood, a former member of Zeta Talk community, who in 2001 published a book entitled Blindsided Planet X Passes in 2003. A lighter would later accuse him of being a confidence trickster. A Japanese cult called the Pana Wave. Uh, laboratory which blocked off roads and rivers with white cloths to protect it itself from electromagnetic attacks also warned that the world would end in May 2003 after the approach of the 10th planet. <laughs> okay, roughly a week later, uh, uh, May the, uh, uh, 2003, when nothing happened. Um, oh, wait, I skipped a part. Uh, this is kind of important. If any of y'all have pets, and, and I don't, if you follow my my channel or subscribe to my channel, you know that I'm a farmer. So of course I've got pets. <laughs> I've got three large dogs and some some livestock out in the back. But um, and her 2003 um, saying that the world's going to come to an end. Uh, lighter. Uh, went on a radio talk show, KROQ FM Radio in Los Angeles, and advised listeners to euthanize their pets in anticipation of the event, as she had done. This led to uh, the 14 times to conclude that she put down her dogs to save them suffering uh, from a, a, a pole shift. Later, in a 2004 interview, she said that she euthanized her dogs because they were acting aggressively. So this is a lady who killed her pets because she thought the world was going to end. But then it goes on because she keeps going on. Okay, later in, uh, she said that the world was going to end on December the 21st, 2012 and we're all going to die. Um, and it was according to the Mayan calendar. Um, well, as you any of y'all know who have ever studied the Mayan calendar, you know the Mayan calendar did not end in 2012. It actually, it carries on. It calculates time in Bactoons, and the Bactoon keeps going on because time to them was circular. Obviously, if you lived through 2012, you know there was no cataclysm. Actually, we woke up, sun was shining, beautiful day like any other day. We went on with our life while other people who thought it was going to be the end of the world, you know, as far as I know, they're, some of them are probably still in their bunkers. <laughs> but anyway, it goes on and on and on about this uh, person. And then let's go to um, uh, other stuff that people have asked me about that's also in this. Um, nemesis. Okay. Believers of Planet X, uh, Nemesis, often uh, often confuse it with Nemesis, a hypothetical 
star first proposed by physicist Richard L. Mueller in 1984. Mueller postulated that a mass extinctions uh, were not random but appeared uh, but appeared to occur in the fossil records with a loose period uh, period I can't even talk tonight. I'm sorry. Periodicity that ranged from 26 to 34 million years. He attributed this a supposed pattern to a heretofore undetected companion to the sun, either a dim red star, uh, red dwarf or a brown dwarf lying in an elliptical uh, 26 million year orbit. So if you want to know where uh, the word nemesis came from, it was proposed by a physicist A. Mueller in 1984. And according to this physicist, uh, his theory of nemesis that he named it is in a uh, 26 million year orbit. At the end of the article it says, although the idea of nemesis appears similar to the Nibiru catalog, uh, they are in fact very different. As nemesis, if it existed, would have an uh, uh, orbital period thousands of times longer and would never come near Earth. Okay, now we get to Hercubus. All of you have probably heard of Hercubus. <laughs> In 1999, a New Age sci-fi writer by the name of V. M. Rubu, I can't even pronounce his last name. Rabu, I don't know. Wrote in Hercubus or Red Planet. That Bernard Star, by the way, Bernard Star is actually a real star. That Bernard Star is actually a planet known to the ancients as Hercubus, which purportedly came dangerously close to Earth in the past, destroying Atlantis and will come close to the Earth again. Lighter, that crazy woman who killed her animals because she thought the world was going to end. Uh, several, several times, 2003, 2012. Now, Lighter is back into the picture, and Lighter subsequently used um, this New Age writer's ideas to boost her claims. Uh, Bernard Starr, by the way, has been uh, measured as nine, excuse me, as 5.98 uh, light years from Earth, which is uh, 35. Point 15 trillion miles from Earth will never come near Earth and Bernard Star is actually a real star <laughs> but again this is a sci-fi new age writer who made up a story called Hercubulus or the Red Planet in other words he made a story up like J.K. Rollins made up <laughs> Harry Potter it's a story. It was meant to amuse people, um, but some people took this story seriously. And now, when you watch some of these YouTube videos, you you hear them talking about Hercubus. It's going to destroy the Earth. Well, again, it was written by a New Age sci-fi writer, <laughs> and it was a story. It it's science fiction. Uh, but there is, it was based on a real star called Bernard Star. Um, anyway, uh, the star will never ever come near Earth. The star um, is only slightly closer to, to the closest star to the sun. Um, it's in the Centauri. And it's, it's still there. If you want to go sky watch, you can look at the star, but it's Again, that star is never going to leave its orbit. Um, so, again, people made it up. So, whenever you hear any of these YouTubers or, or anybody else who's talking about the Nibiru system talk about Hercubus, it's written by a science fiction New Age writer. Um, and it's a story. It's not based on any kind of reality, it's not based on any kind of science. Um, again, a nemesis was postulated by a, a physicist, a real physicist named Richard A. Mueller, 
1984, but again, it's in theory, and his theory is that this nemesis, as he calls it, is 26 million uh, miles away from Earth. And it, if it existed, its orbit would be thousands of times longer. It would never, ever come near Earth itself. So if you hear, Nemesis is coming to destroy the Earth. Nemesis is a theory. <coughs> they don't even know if it exists. It's a theory that's 26 million years orbit orbit does not ever come near Earth and it is a theory has not been proven so if you hear Nemesis is coming to destroy the Earth no okay then we have uh, Sedna and Eris okay now still a lot of people confuse this as something that's going to come and destroy the Earth again no but with uh, Eris, Eris is now classified as a dwarf planet, not a dwarf star. It's never going to come near Earth. Sedna's never going to come near Earth. Uh, Sedna, uh, uh, Sedna was discovered by Mike Brown in 2003 and 2005, respectively. Uh, however, it, it, it at one time had been uh, described as the 10th planet in early NASA press releases they now know that no it isn't that it isn't the tenth planet it isn't Nibiru um, let's go on let's see what else oh it talks about comets, comet, comet eyes on not gonna destroy the earth, comet Alien is not going to destroy the Earth. Um, then it goes on and on. But y'all can look this up for yourself so you know when people are talking to you about um, Hercubus and Nemesis is coming to destroy the Earth. It's crap, y'all. <laughs> so when people are speaking to you, you know, let, call them on their BS. That, that, that should be our new pledge. Call them on their BS. Um, so anyway, that's just a little bit of research for you guys. Now I'm also going to talk to you about, let's get another picture up here. Um, some of my own. Now I'm going to talk to you very nicely about this because I don't want to scare anybody. Uh, and I want to phrase my words very, very carefully. I want to talk to you about DARPA. I don't know if you've ever heard of DARPA, but DARPA uh, is basically <laughs> where a lot of our tax money goes to. Normally they do all kinds of wild stuff, but uh, recently they have, how do I say this nicely without freaking anybody else? Uh, sorry, the picture went black there because it, uh, it's loading up a whole lot of pictures. Um, DARPA ha is doing this new thing that y'all probably have not heard about, but I'm going to post a link to another YouTuber's channel uh, so you could uh, take a look at that YouTuber's channel. Now, this YouTuber is also uh, a UFO enthusiast, um, so take that as you will but he did a great great YouTube piece about DARPA basically what our government is doing is they are putting up a, a military space command let me say that again a military space command it is a mobile unit that can travel anywhere in the world uh, they're putting it right now in Australia. Hmm. Um, again, the word military space command. Why are they uh, the military dealing with anything in space? I'm going to put a link to that video again for y'all to watch. Um, and we will discuss it later. All of my friends who are really big uh, UFO enthusiasts, 
think that this is the way our military is making contact instead of we the people making contact with extraterrestrials if they are out there because there's we have no idea if the people of Nibiru even still exist for all I know they have gone ex ex extinct we don't know we don't know if they're alive or but our military has spent billions of our taxpayer dollars putting this DARPA system together where our military will be dealing with things in space. Now my friends who are UFO enthusiasts believe that again it's them making contact with extraterrestrials. But one of the other things that this DARPA program also does is it uh, destroys and de uh, deflects asteroids. So that's why I'm bringing it to your attention because as you know we've been studying the asteroid fields. Okay, a lot of questions. Um, okay, this one was about explain exactly where the uh, system is between Mars and Jupiter. I've already done that. Uh, they, they're asking me to put a hula hoop in place uh, by the system to explain, to make it easier to understand. Um, well, I think that picture did a lot to explain it to you. Um, I'm reading what they said. A long series of questions. Okay. Um, well, anyway, um, I think that picture explained it as best as I possibly can. It's on a 3,600 year orbit. Uh, you saw the long elliptical orbit in that picture. Um, it travels between the space of Mars and Jupiter. It never leaves its neighborhood. It will never come near Earth. There are no planets beside Earth. I'm also going to put a link to this video because I've been getting a lot of those questions again about explain why. Oh, this picture here is to show you how the telescopes move. As, uh, not all telescopes stay stationary in the sky. They move toward um, the objects they're trying to show. This is a um, panoramic view of the orb coming out from behind the observatory. Because uh, another person had kept saying, it's lens flare! It's lens flare! Well, if there was lens flare, it would be on the observatory walls. It wouldn't be coming up from behind the observatory. Um, so anyway, I'm going to let that run while I talk and answer questions. Um, Mark Seven said, I love your optimistic attitude. However, you mentioned the government and NASA are not hiding the Nibiru system several times. Uh, why do you believe that they are not sharing this information? Is this not deceiving the public? Oh, yes, it's deceiving the public, but why they're not sharing the information is because the United States government has not and ha probably will not in the near future admit that extraterrestrials exist, much less that they've been dealing with them for decades. Um, yes, this is deceiving the public. Yeah, they're hoping that the ignorant people stay as ignorant as possible because they're easier to control. Um, yes, it's deceiving the public. Uh, that's the best way I can answer that. Also, I don't think they want to get into the religious aspects of it, too. Um, again, brief, brief statement on religion. As you know, that um, when the uh, Anunnaki came to Earth and helped uh, jumpstart our DNA, they also gave us science, math, uh, government, uh, and their version of religion. So the Torah, the uh, Christian Bible, and also the Quran, the real Quran, not this BS ISIS stuff, but the real Quran. Those three major religions came out of and was based on Sumerian culture. So, you know, they don't really want to get into talk about extraterrestrials or religion, but mostly they don't want to talk about extraterrestrials. They don't want to admit what they've been doing. 
Uh, they don't want to admit we're they're getting a lot of this um, stuff that they've got. They've got some neat stuff. Actually, you'll see some of that neat stuff when you watch that DARPA video. Um, and again, I'm going to put the link down bo uh, below. And I do suggest that y'all watch that DARPA video. It's very, very interesting. Um, let's see. Is there a real possibility that the tra tra trajectory of Nibiru will pass near Earth towards uh, December through this year with a potential cat cat catastrophic uh, damage? You can barely read your handwriting here. Um, no, the Nibiru system never leaves its orbit. It never leaves its neck of the, the its neighborhood, and we never leave our neighborhood. It's been traveling in that orbit for millions and millions and millions and millions of years. It's traveling through it now. Beautiful shot of it right there. Um, it's traveling through it now. Um, we're part of the lucky generation we get to see it. Um, but after it, it's gone, it, it's going to be gone, and it'll be another 3,600 years before it passes our way again. So... No, um, all the stuff that you're seeing and hearing from other YouTubers about Nemesis and uh, Hercubus and, you know, uh, all this stuff, it's going to crash into Earth. This is not going to happen. And I've explained to you again and again what would happen if a planet was right beside the Earth, that the entire Earth would be destroyed. Um... What I've decided to do is I'm also going to put a link down for you to read it from a physicist yourself who will explain to you exactly, as I said, that if anything, if there was a, uh, a body next to the Earth, not our moon, but a, a foreign body such as a planet beside our Earth, what would happen to our planet? Um, and it's a long, I think it's three or four pages long, but it basically says the Earth. So again, there's there's no large planet beside our planet, and there's no large planet coming toward our planet to destroy us. Um, it's all made up. They made this stuff up. They did it to sell books, to make money. Um, again, I can't explain to you what other people's intentions are. <sighs> Again, I call, uh, I'm call. i calling all of you people, you subscribers and viewers, other yet. What science, what textbooks, who wrote the textbook? What year was it published? Is it an article from a physicist article published? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ask them where they're getting their information from. Don't accept what they're saying. Call them on their BS. Because um, knowledge is power. And I'm trying to... <laughs> I'm making these videos so I can empower y'all to um, etc. I want to I want you to be informed so you can make the best decisions for your own life. Um, again, let me go back to the questions. Okay, uh, question was was any any object going to pass near Earth in December of this year with a potential catastrophic damage? No. Um, what we have to look out for, and I, I've explained it to you before, I'll explain it again. With the Nibiru system, with its long elliptical orbit, it travels through the Kuiper belt and it travels through the asteroid belts. When it travels through these two belts, the, the gravitational force of the Nibiru system drags behind it asteroids and meteors that it has pulled out of the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt. When the Nibiru system leaves, when it's on its uh, outward trajectory out back into space, um, it, it will take with it 
all the asteroids and meteors that are close to its gravitational pull. So the asteroids and meteors that are close to it will go out when the system goes out. The problem that we have to look out for is out here. The asteroids and meteors that are not close to the Nibiru system. Those asteroids and those meteors have to go somewhere. Uh, if you've been following uh, local news or uh, evening news or science news, you know that uh, Jupiter just got hit by a very large object. Um, they call it the explosion on Jupiter. Well, that was an asteroid that hit it. Um, I, I, Jupiter is going to get hit with asteroids. Mars is going to get hit with asteroids. Those asteroids and meteors that are not pulled into the gravitational field of the Nibiru system are going to have to go somewhere. There is a possibility, a real possibility that one or more may fall to Earth. Well, asteroids and meteors fall to Earth all the time, whether you know it or not. The only reason you're paying attention to it now is because we're looking at it in the telescopes. Uh, people are pointing it out. I'm pointing it out to you because that's a, it, it happens. Actually, what was it? June 2nd, uh, an asteroid that was five feet in diameter uh, struck Arizona, and its lights were so bright they saw it all the way in New Mexico. But asteroids and meteors hit Earth all the time. Uh, most of them cause relatively no damage at all. Um, but that is something that we're going to have to be aware of. Now, how do you protect yourself from a meteor? Well, a meteor in a telescope is like a grain of sand. You can barely see it. So there's really nothing you can do about a meteor. If it's going to fall, it's going to fall. Uh, an asteroid, something completely different. You can see it in the telescopes. Our government is working on it. Again, I'm going to put that link to that DARPA video. Uh, of that other YouTuber because it was very, very interesting. Um, military in space. Hmm. Interesting. But um, you know that the, they also have that green uh, beam in Antarctica. Okay, the Australians are saying that green beam in theirs is for to study the ozone. So they're shooting it up in space to study the ozone. But at least the Americans are a little bit more honest and they're like, no, uh, we're using it for, you know, possible asteroids to deflect them, to push them away. So at least the Americans are being a little bit more honest. Okay, more questions here. Will we cross through Nibiru's asteroid belt in 150 days twice? What? Will we cross through Nibiru's asteroid belt for 150 days twice? I don't understand your question. Um, uh, but I might because I do watch other people's YouTube videos and I do remember hearing some BS <laughs> uh, about that. Hold on just a second. Let me go back over here. Let's pull this one up. Um, again, call people, ask them where they get their information from. Because I had heard this before uh, from another YouTuber's video. Let me pull this up so it's nice and big. Okay, what I heard, and I don't know if you watched the same uh, video that I did, uh, but this YouTuber was saying that uh, Nibiru, it takes tremendous amount of time to go through the earth uh, and again it never goes near the earth it travels between Mars and Jupiter uh, this is the asteroid belt here but they were saying that, um, that near it will pass by it twice you know, and as it's leaving well, again, it never comes near Earth. It travels between the space of Mars and Jupiter. 
it travels right here in between this space. And that space is, let me grab my notes, because I don't remember offhand. Uh, where is that? I have it in this notes. Oh, of course I don't have it in these notes. <laughs> it was 300 and something other um, million miles. That's the distance between this. I wish I could give you the exact number, but I don't have my notes in front of me. Um, but note, Nibiru never ever leaves its orbit. It always stays in its neck of the woods in its neighborhood, and we always stay in ours. Um, so I, I did see another YouTuber's video that said something to the effect of we would get hit twice by going near something about asteroids or something. No. Um, I think that's what your question was, but no. Again, okay, this is the Sun, this is Mercury, this is Venus, this is Earth, this is Mars, and this is Jupiter. This is the asteroid belt. It does travel in a long elliptical orbit. Okay, again, this is Jupiter, so now it's in the asteroid belt. It is knocking some of those asteroids and meteors around in the asteroid belt. They've got to go somewhere. Uh, the ones that are closest to the Nibiru system will uh, go with it as it leaves out of our, our neck of the woods. But some of those asteroids and some of those meteors, it is a possibility that uh, one or more could fall to Earth. As I said before, we get hit with meteors and asteroids all the time. The only reason anybody's paying attention to it right now is because the Nibiru, the Nibiru system is in our neck of the woods. It's in our, our neighborhood, but it's way, way on another street in our neighborhood not ever coming near Earth. Um, so I understand that question. Again, I saw it on another YouTuber's video, but no, um, that's not true. That's not true. Um, this is Nibiru's orbit. So those meteors and asteroids have a chance to be knocked out of its system and fall, probably hit Mars first, or go out here. They have to go somewhere. They're going to go somewhere out in here. But there is, yes, a chance that we would get hit by a, a asteroid or a meteor. Are we prepared for it? That's the thing. Are we prepared for it? Um, again, I really encourage y'all to watch that DARPA video. Um, incredibly interesting. Our military in space. I liked what they talked about, about the asteroids. Um, they could, this DARPA uh, unit that they built is mobile. It can travel anywhere in the world. They can set it up and destroy it toward Earth. Uh, you might have heard in the news that they've got something coming down to Jupiter real soon. Actually, it will be July the 4th. Uh, so we'll get some really good pictures of Jupiter. Notice the coincidence. Notice the timing. That says, uh, what's going on in Jupiter? They basically want to see. I think they're more interested in what's going on in here with the Nibiru system than Jupiter. But that's just my thought. Okay, let's see. Oh, 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 I was asked if I could share some tips with Australians that they would love it. Okay, in the morning, Scott. Oh, I, oh, let's go to the new pictures that I've taken. Y'all will be freaked out. Okay, uh, I should tell you beforehand, I have shown these pictures from te various telescopes to other uh, people that are my friends. These other people are so what before I even show you, before I even show you, what they say it is, is I have captured a UFO, whether it be extra or we leave it for 
have Australian telescopes. I've also got it on t uh, two other telescopes. And saying it. My problem is, because I've been studying these telescopes for so long that I have to be honest, honest with you whether you like it or not. In telescopes in America, in the United States, I have seen objects that could and I do call UFOs. They are some kind of man-made or human-made ship, whether they came from Earth or someplace else. I've seen them on the telescopes before, but I've only seen them in telescopes from the United States. Never seen them in Russia, never seen them in China, etc., etc., etc. I'm not saying that um, extra extraterrestrials don't visit Australia. I think they would be interested in it. Shoot, I'm a Texan. I'm interested in Australia. I'd love to go to Australia. Um, but I don't think that's what I've captured here. I think think, and I can't explain it correctly, I could not explain it to my very close and dear friends, so I doubt if I can explain it to you, but let's look through some of the pictures, and I will try to do my best. Okay, I was starting out in Savannah Skies in Australia. This is a, 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 a telescope in Australia, and I started on the 29th, and this is, um, let me just Let's go ahead and start it. I'll do a slow sideshow, and um, so you can look at the pictures again. It takes some time to load. This has a lot of pictures to load. Uh, let me put it on fade so you can get a better image of it. What I was studying in the Australian telescopes was I was looking at these little dots, trying to see what moves and what does not move. And I kept seeing this red dot right here. I don't know if see it, but it doesn't move. And I see it at night, not only in this telescope, but in other telescopes, this red dot that doesn't move. And it kind of freaks me out. So um, I was studying the, uh, the Australian skies, specifically this one telescope because I wanted to look at this red dot. Then as we zoom along, and I'm just going to zoom very fast through here, um, in the early pre-dawn hours, now see I started seeing this light come up. Now, okay, because the sideshow is in the way, you can't really see that this is from June the 29th at 3.26 um, Australian time and this light source came up. Now think about this. Okay, this picture now is it's changed to uh, 336 because this is I've got it on time lapse so you can look at it. What is this light source? Is it the moon coming up at this time? Um, if you can look at the, the top of the screen up there, you can see the time lapse. The, the, the time keeps changing. See up, up at the top? Now, every time I move the cursor, that thing comes down. I mean, just leave the cursor alone and let it fade back, and you can see it. It's time lapsing. I don't know enough about Australia to know when your sun, excuse me, when your moon rises and sets. But this picture you're looking at right now is 4.51 in the morning. And I would think that the moon had already gone from the east to the west, moving toward the west. Notice this is the north. This is the south in this telescope. This is the north. This is the south. This is the east. And this is the west. Well, this light source, whether it be the moon or whatever the heck it is. Notice it's got a red orb behind it. So if your moon, if 
people from Australia, if you're watching this, please leave a comment or send me an email and tell me if your moon rises from the northeast. And see, now you can see the light coming right over here. This is the sun rising in the morning. Okay? And then it just vanished. Now look at this. Watch it just fade away. Look at the time stamp on the top. Watch it just fade away. It's not going toward Earth. It's going away from Earth. Now all of my friends saw this in the, the, the other four telescopes and watched this and said, this is something leaving the planet Earth. And it's going out into deep space where... <laughs> The Nibiru system is. Well, the Nibiru system, let me move my cursor over here, is around here. Notice that it went up here. See, there's that red dot that stays the same. It still stays the same. It was there in the, the nighttime sky, and now it's in the morning sky. But I thought that was very strange that there was a light source that I saw coming up before the, the, the sunrise and then it just looked like it went out into space. I can't explain to you what that light source is. Um, it does not make sense. Um, I cannot say if it's a UFO or not, although all of my friends keep telling me, yes, it is a UFO. You captured it. I can't say that because I don't know what the heck it is. The mirror system in the morning. This is at 811 off the Savannah Skies Telescope in Australia. And notice right over here, there's another light source. This is the sun coming up. What is this right here by the sun? Remember I told you that this line right here helps you kind of navigate where the middle of the sun is in the sky. So what is this? What is this coming off our sun? I can't explain that. I find that very, very odd. Okay, that was the end of that one. Let's go to another telescope. Um, okay, we did Australian sky, uh, excuse me, Savannah skies. Let's do the uh, this one. This is Craigie, Western Australia. Okay, again, here's the slide source. Let's put it on another sideshow so you can see it. Again, it's got to load. It always has to load. It takes a long. Okay, let's put it on a fade so you can see. Okay, notice this light source. The time in here, let me stop moving the cursor so that stupid thing on the top will go away. June 29th at 5.07 in the morning. Is For y'all Australians out there, is that your moon? If so, what is your moon doing in the eastern sky, the northeastern sky? See, I don't think it's the moon. But I don't know because I'm not used to studying Australian skies early in the morning. This is before sunup. What is that beam of light? That large beam of light. And let's just watch it for a little while. And notice it's starting to create an orb. And watch the dot and then watch the time lapse on top. Okay, morning sun coming up. Still there. Sun's starting to come up. Creating an orb. See, this is why I don't think it's a UFO. Why would it create an orb? See, I'm so used to... But my mindset on orbs... 
So, and I'm so used to looking at the telescope that when I see something with an orb, it's like, oh, that has something to do with light and how light reflects and ref uh, it's refracting light. Okay, the morning sun is coming up. There's that dot. It's much smaller now. Oh, that's another picture of uh, the dot from the ground. But look at the shape. Oh, okay, that, then it went away. Okay, let's stop this. Let's get to another one. Okay, where's the one that drove everyone crazy? Is this one it? I don't know if it was this one or the other one. Okay. Let's put it on a sideshow. Do a fade. Because there's one that starts out, out in the beginning where it looks like there's a flash of light and then it, you see it moving across the sky. I don't think this is uh, the one. This is just, an, I think, another telescope. This is from Deakin, um, Australia. And we're looking right up in here. See it starting to go out into the sky. Gets smaller and smaller. And then it just fades out. Let's go to another telescope. Oh, wait, let's see if there's more on this. Because when I first saw it, I just went to as many telescopes as I could really really fast because I just wanted to capture it here's a morning sky this is 759 809 819 829 notice this striped Thing over here. Oh, let's go back. Notice this striped thing over here. No, let's go back. See it? Right there as the sun's coming up. Let's go to the other one. One that I got. It's, it started out looking like an explosion. That's it. Okay, let's put it on a sideshow. That's the one my friends are like, you got it! I can't believe you got it! But, see, I can't explain this. I can't explain why there would be a huge burst of light like that. Because it didn't create an orb, but in other telescopes, you could see an orb, and then you see this, it just fades away. You just see it fading away out into space. And I have to be <laughs> stop boys, stop it. No. I have to be honest with you. When I look at these telescopes and I do it's very rare, but when you see a object, it looks like a man made object. As in a ship or something. Boys, stop fighting. Stop what are you fighting over? It looks like a man-made object, a ship, whether it's saucer-shaped or whatever. This looks like a beam of light. And see, I think I'm having a problem with the fact that it's a beam of light. And we got into a, a huge discussion about this. Um, because, first of all, uh, what is the old saying? First, eliminate the obvious, and then what? What the, the truth is the last thing that's you pick or something like that. So that's Sherlock Holmes. They were quoting Sherlock Holmes to me. Okay, a burst of light coming from Australia. Is Australians um, missiles? Why would they do that? Are Australians sending out rocket ships? Why would they do that? Again, see, this is the burst of light. That's the first thing I noticed. It's like, what? What happened? There's this burst of light, and then I kept seeing this light, 
So I went to every telescope I could where I saw this light at this on the same day at the same time. And this is this is the one the teles excuse me, the telescope that just I couldn't understand what I was seeing. So I had to capture it in many different telescopes. And I can't explain it to you. Other than when I see something in the sky that looks man made, then I can say it's a UFO. This, I don't know what the heck it is. Now notice the Nibiru system is down here. So what was that that just went that way? I don't know what that was. I was also told by my friends that when I post uh, this video, I should um, have an open mind and, and tell y'all to have an open mind. But um, my mind's open a little bit, but not that much. <laughs> and um, I, again, when I look at these telescopes and I see, you know, a, a UFO, in it, it's usually in America. It's extremely rare, but it always looks like some kind of man-made object. This looks like light. But here's the Nibiru system. And we know, of course, the sun's light hits the Nibiru system. It cast out orbs. This is happening pre-dawn. This exact uh, time is 5.53 on June the 29th. We're going to watch it again. I'm going to let y'all. This is the one that kind of started everything. So you see the sun starting to rise and the thing is like going out into space. And I can't explain it. It's not falling toward Earth. It's going away from Earth. And then early morning, 7 a.m., seeing the sun in the sky. Seeing the Nibiru system. Okay, now that you've seen that a couple times, let's go look at it from uh, China, because I film I got it in uh, two Chinese uh, telescopes as it's going through the sky. Okay, early morning in, in China, and normally, okay, normally, normally when you're looking at the the, the telescopes in Hong Kong, normally the pollution is so bad you could barely see anything. Um, so I was actually surprised to actually get something. Now this is early morning. See you've got this light source in the sky. What is this thing? And then you just watch it disappear into space. It starts getting smaller and smaller. Again, this is from China. And please, even though my last name is Jung, please don't ask me to pronounce this correctly. Uh, in English, it's the National Education Astronomical Center. Um, but in Chinese, I don't know how to pronounce it. But, okay, let, that's one from China from Hong Kong. Let's go to another one from Hong Kong. Um, this is the Hong Kong Space Museum. And normally you can't get anything good from this one um, because of the way they positioned it. Let's put it on a slideshow. Again, let it load up. This thing is so slow. Let's put it on a fade. There's the light source. This is 5.12 in the morning. Got the sun starting to come up. You got that light source. What's that? What's that thing? Barely see it. Little dot. See, there it is. Little dot. It's going straight up.
You know, the Australians shooting off missiles or they got a rocket they launched and the Chinese had caught it on two of their their telescopes. I don't know. You guys from Australia, you tell me. This was taken on June the 29th. Did you have a secret space program where you were shooting off a rocket or a missile? And if it was a missile, where were you shooting the missile at? Who were you shooting the missile? The missile has to go somewhere. Missiles always come back down to the ground. Um, if it was a rocket, when did you get a space program? Um, I did not know you had a space program. And I'm not being facetious. I really, uh, it's an honest question. Um, do you, do you send, leave a comment or send me an email? Because I'm interested now. What is this thing? And all I can say is that there was an object in the sky and it's not coming toward Earth, it's going away from Earth. It's just moving away from Earth. It's gone behind the clouds now. 5.32 in the morning. 5.37 in the morning. 5.42, you can see it right there coming out of the clouds 547 I can't explain that I don't know what that is um, I don't know what that is um, but for you Australians um, please leave me a comment because I'm interested to know if you have a space program <laughs> um, if you want to look at for the Nibiru system um, your best bet is early morning. Um, you'll see it on the right hand side. Um, as the sun moves across the sky, you'll see it going behind this, the sun and you'll see weird stuff behind the sun. And then as the, the sun keeps moving across the sky, you'll see it on uh, the, the other side of the sun. Um, let's go to an, another Thing. Those are the, the five ones, the five observatories. Uh, if you want to know the names of those observatories, it's Savannah Skies. Um, it is the Hong Kong Space Museum in Hong Kong, that telescope. Um, oh gosh, I, this one's in Chinese. Hu Kun Natural Educational Kun Astronomical Center in Hong Kong. The second one was uh, Gorge Creek Orchards in Australia and the other one was uh, Deke, uh, Deacon Australia and the other one was Craigie. Actually did we look at uh, did we look at uh, Gorge Creek Orchards? I don't remember that. Let's see. Oh yeah that's the one where the that's the one where I first captured the explosion was Gorge Creek Orchards, Melbourne, Australia uh, June the 29th at 5.53 <coughs> so yeah those five those five oh wait a minute there's Astro Park did I get it also at Astro Park in Hong Kong let's see yes I did oh so there's six there's six telescopes, six different telescopes. I got it. There's the little thing, the little dot. June the 29th, 5 24 in the morning. Slow time lapse so you can see it move. Again, I don't know what that is. That is. But now I'm interested. Now I want to go to these telescopes every single day and see if I see that again. Because I've never seen that in any American telescope. I've never seen it in Canadian or Brazilian, etc., etc. 
So why am I getting it in uh, Hong Kong telescopes and Australian telescopes? Boys, stop writing. I can't explain that to you. I can't explain it to you. But uh, again, that DARPA video that I'm going to put a link through, you know the military commanders uh, for that DARPA program are going to Australia. That's the first place it's being set up at. Which again puts fuel to the fire to my friends who are UFO enthusiasts saying, aha, you captured an image of something coming out of Australia you caught it on all these different telescopes and now DARPA our US government is putting stuff in Australia what is that about and what are they putting up military command post for space military command posts for space okay don't know what to make of that um, let's see, I think I've answered most of these questions. Um, last question, um, basically they want to know exactly what, where the position of the Nibiru system is. Um, let's go back to this. Exactly where the position of the Nibiru system is between Mars and Jupiter they want to know the exact coordinates. I, I'm sorry I couldn't tell you that. I just know it's between Mars and Jupiter. And that it will never leave its neighborhood. It's never coming close to us. So you don't have to worry about it crashing into us. Um, but it's exact coordinates I could not give you. Um, oh, here's another one. Silendia Lane um, is asking me about uh, comp soil compositions. What is Nibiru made of? I have no idea. I, 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 I couldn't tell you what their soil sample is. Um, I can tell you a little bit about what they say about uh, their home planet, that it's reddish in radiance, um, that, it, that it makes a long... Uh, elliptical orbit around the sun. Uh, it talks about its planets. Um, in the cold period, the inner heat of Nibiru, it keeps about the planet like a warm blanket that is consistently renewed. In the hot period, it shields Nibiru from the sun's scorching rays. In the midst rains, it holds and releases to lakes and streams giving rise. Lush ve vegetation our atmosphere feeds and protects all manner of life and waters and on land it's it's uh, to sprout a cause I'm sorry getting tongue tied um, I couldn't tell you what the soil sample is I think you're asking me that question because you've heard other uh, youtubers talk about iron oxide Nothing in the pre-Nubian or Sumerian texts ever talks about Nibiru being an iron oxide planet. I don't know where they get that from. It is red. It is red, but just because a planet is red doesn't mean it's, you know, heavily an iron oxide planet. Um, so um, I, I couldn't an answer you about the soil samples. I could... Uh, point you toward the uh, a video that I, I made about Nibiru's gold, about the monatomic gold, um, which they were using to patch up the hole in their atmosphere. Um, monatomic gold oh, is very complicated to explain. First you take, I'm sorry, uh, I'm trying to make a joke, but it's just incredibly difficult. First you take um, gold, gold the metal. Uh, gold metal has 79 atoms. You can break those that gold down to make something called a colloidal gold, which I can barely say. My mouth doesn't want to wrap around that word. Uh, a colloidal gold is tiny nanoparticles of gold 
and some suspended in some kind of liquid. You might have heard of colloidal silver, which is a great antibacterial uh, uh, agent that is an antibiotic. It's a natural substance, um, but if you take too much of it, you could get uh, metal poisoning. So don't take too much of it. But um, you, you've probably heard of colloidal silver, but you've probably never heard of colloidal gold. But what they do, what the Nibiru's, uh, what they were doing on Nibiru, the Anunnaki, is they were taking the gold and powdering it, turning it into monoatomic gold. Specifically, what monoatomic gold is, let me try to, to explain. Um, if you take gold and you reduce it down to only two atoms, it is still gold. But if you take gold and reduce it to one atom, that one atom will disintegrate and become monoatomic atoms. At that point, it is no longer gold, the metal. It is now a ceramic. This ceramic has crazy, phenomenal properties. You have to do the science to understand it. Actually, when I did the video, Nibiru's Gold, I had two PhDs explain it uh, much better than I could. Basically, what they're learning about monoatomic gold is, is a whole new science. It has anti-gravity properties. It has interdimensional properties. Um, people don't understand what I'm saying when I say interdimensional. Basically, what they would do is our scientists, our scientists, would take this gold and they would put it into a machine. They would take the monoatomic gold, put it in a machine. They'd heat it up and cool it. They'd heat it up and cool it. They kept experimenting with heating it up and cooling it. Well, at one point, when you heat it up to a certain uh, temperature and a certain time, the monoatomic gold in the machine would literally disappear. Let me say that again. It would literally disappear. They would see the sample in the machine, and then once they got it to a certain heat at a certain uh, amount of time, that material would disappear from view. What they would do is they did further experiments on many different machines with many different scientists where once it became invisible, they would open up the machine and, tr and remembering where the monatomic gold was placed in the machine, they would try to scoop out some invisible properties uh, kind of imagine this in your head. They would take a little scoop and try to scoop out um, the, the monoatomic gold when it was invisible. They would take that into another room, another location, and it was secured in another location. Then they would come back, close the machine, heat it up again, cool it again, heat it up again, cool it again. When it became visible again, completely visible where they could see it in the machine, all of the properties were still there. In other words, when they were doing that experiment where they were scooping out the invisible, invisible monoatomic gold and taking it to another room, it wasn't there. There was nothing there. It went to another dimension. And when it was visible again, it came back to our dimension. Um, I know that's a mind-blowing statement, which is why when I made the video uh, Nibiru's Goal, I had physicists explain it instead of me trying to explain it. Um, it is a science that our scientists are just now learning, trying to understand, and it is freaking mind-blowing. Uh, its implications in science and especially in medicine uh, really are astounding. I was blown away, especially the, the, the medicinal side of monoatomic gold and monoatomic uh, mono platinums. What they're doing with that in cancer research, unbelievable. Unbelievable. It basically corrects your DNA. Um, 
again, I can't explain it to you any better than the physicists can because to me, I, it just blows my mind. I strongly suggest that you watch the Nibiru's uh, gold, um, if you about monoatomic gold, uh, mind blowing properties both in science and in, in medicine. And these people were doing it a whole long time ago. Um, think about it, the ancient Sumerian texts were written down over 6,000 years ago. They were doing it way before then. The, the entire reason they came to earth was to get the gold. Uh, now we know how important that gold really was to them because uh, they were taking it and powdering it. Actually, let me read their exact words about that. Let me grab it. Notes I, I do actually have. Uh, let's see. Uh, when they were talking about uh, the problems with their atmospheres, they had studied the the, the soil was examined, the lakes and streams they put to the test. Um, and they were talking about what they were going to do. In their atmosphere, a breaching hole occurred. That was their findings. And they were talking about, you know, trying to make the, the volcanoes go off again. And hopefully that would patch the hole in their ozone, but it didn't. <laughs> um, but one of their solutions was, let me read this exactly as they, they wrote it. It was the only substance that to the finest powder could be ground. Lofted high to heaven, suspended it could remain. Thus with replenishments, the breach it would heal. Protection make better. So basically they were taking the gold and turning it into the finest powder which is monoatomic gold. Yeah, some unbelievable stuff. Um, again, another person is asking me about the exact position between Mars and Jupiter. Where is Nibiru located? Again, I can't answer that. It's located between the space of Mars and Jupiter. Um, that is its neighborhood. That's where it will remain. Uh, that's about all for tonight because unfortunately, uh, I, as I've told y'all before, I work four jobs. Um, I know <laughs> that sounds amazing and it's a lot and it is, oh my gosh, it is so much. Um, but I'm a legal assistant by the day. Uh, in the morning and evenings when I get home, I'm a farmer. Um, I'm also a fine artist and a photographer and I have to go get ready to go to work tonight and then get home hopefully before 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning get up at 5.30 in the morning to start feeding the livestock and taking care of the, the farm before I leave at 6.30 to go to my legal position job so I'm tired, I'm exhausted and I'll do another video for you later uh, keep the questions coming and uh, leave a comment down below I hope this was helpful in some ways and again when you hear anybody talk about uh, nemesis or Hercubus, um, noted it is crap. <laughs> Consider the source. And remember when you're watching these other YouTubers videos, ask them where they're getting their information from. Ask them again, you know, what what is this based on? You know, what Arthur wrote this? What book is it in? What year was it published? Did a physicist uh, write this article? What article was the was this material published in, etc., etc. Um, I'm finding that a lot of people who are making YouTube videos on the Bureau system have never, ever, ever, ever <laughs> read any of the Sumerian texts for themselves. Um, so they're just making it up as they go along and scaring the bejeebus out of a lot of people. Um, so all I have to you guys is I love you. Stay informed. Keep doing the research. Keep looking at the telescopes. Um, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. So I'll talk to you again uh, sometime later. Bye-bye, y'all, and have a nice day.